Hello and welcome to another episode of Be The Bank. My name is Robert Heithe, your host from FixNotes.com. Thank you for joining us today for another discussion on the secondary mortgage market. This is the last show of 2020, can you believe it? Before we get into the episode here, I wanna let you guys know if you are tuning into the show after we've published the live episode, you can use the scrubber bar at the bottom of this video to jump ahead to any section of this video that is most relevant to you. So if you wanna skip the intro and jump right to the case studies, just go down and you'll see the chapter sections in the scroll bar below this video. <laughs> in any case though, let's get right into today's episode by thanking the 10 investors who have signed our non-disclosure agreement to review assets for sale going into 2021. So Joshua, Henry, Ali, Rob, Jerome, Misha, Henry, Almag, Charles, and Bert, thank you all so much for signing up at fixnotes.com slash buy. I have not sent you any product yet because we are sold out for the year, but going into 2021, you're in the right place to receive asset opportunities for sale. Okay, let's jump right into today's episode without further ado here, and let's get going. All right, everyone, episode number 28 for December 30th, 2020. We'll start with the overview. I'll let you know some free things that Fixed Notes has to offer. We'll talk about the tech that we use to make this business work. Uh, today's topic actually is all about some of the mantras, some of the um, kind of words of wisdom going into 2021 that I believe work for all businesses and entrepreneurs can follow these principles, but especially for the note business. Um, that's our feature for today. We'll talk about asset acquisition opportunities, case studies and some giveaways uh, of course every week we talk about how you can get on a free consultation call with me so let's get right into the show here um, with a quick commercial i'm going to run through this very quick because you guys know what this is about fixnotes.com slash learn is our how to invest in mortgage notes free online course which has a whole bunch of content that you'll find useful as a seasoned note investor or as a beginner getting into the space. We've got fixnotes.com slash news, the industry news aggregator, where we uh, take an RSS feed from all over the internet and boil it down into one place where you can see all of that curated information on the industry. I put up a bunch of new articles last night for December, closing in on another 100 article month. Might be a little under 100 for December, slower news month with the holidays, but there's plenty of new information there. Then we'll talk about uh, a glossary of terms, all the mortgage note information that you need if you've come across a, a word or um, some lingo that you may not be familiar with. Go to fixnotes.com slash terms for the lowdown. And then finally, uh, of course, fixnotes.com slash buy, but I wanted to mention our Mortgage Notes Mastermind. So um, give a quick update here on the Mastermind group. Uh, this offers 50% off consulting if you join the group at $30 per month, um, a private Podio workspace, and we're gonna start doing monthly member Zoom calls for all of our Mastermind members. Um, the Podio workspace, I'll show you in a sec, includes tools and templates and a whole bunch of content that can give you another leg up in this industry. We are increasing the monthly rate for the mastermind group to 40 per month. Now, anybody who signs up at the 30 per month rate is grandfathered into that payment plan going forward. Um, but if you sign up past January 1st, and it says 21st, but no, it's increasing to $40 per month on the 1st, 2021. I don't know why I have the 21st there, but in any case, definitely take a look at that um, so you can take advantage of it before it ends on Thursday, uh, the end of December. Um, just to show you that Podio workspace very quickly here, it's uh, got all of the events in the industry, uh, both you know other webinars and conferences along with my show, forums so you can ask me questions at no additional charge, case studies, all the detail from the case studies in this show, all of the counties, we have a database of the counties and states in the country with a whole bunch of content on foreclosure timelines, foreclosure expense estimates, REO estimates. Um, then we've got, of course, the states, judicial, non-judicial, whether it's a super lien state where you have a homeowners association lien taking precedence over a mortgage lien. Then we've got inventory. So this is like a template that you can use for organizing your own inventory records in Podio. 
um, and it also contains all the data from our case studies. And then finally, document templates. We've got RESPA letters, payoff agreements, satisfaction and lien release documents, uh, assignments of mortgage, a whole bunch of content there that you can use to plug into your note business. So once again, that's the Fix Notes Mastermind. Please consider joining. Uh, it supports the channel very much. And the more members that we can get into that group, the more time I can invest in making that mastermind group as best as it can be for you, for your business. All right, so right into the show here um, with the industry overview, we're gonna go through our two standard slides, which are the non-performing waterfall evaluation. And I'm gonna change it up like so, oops, like this. And we're also gonna talk about the market pricing, which we'll be providing an update to going into next quarter, into Q1 2021. Um, but as you know, and you're familiar with this slide, the non-performing waterfall evaluation is how we analyze mortgage notes when we first receive a tape. Now, before we get into this, think of your questions here because this is really a, an opportunity to hone in on some specifics that you're interested in. But let's take a look at that uh, little tit mouse that's hanging out by the feeder. I've got the zoom, oops, got the zoom lens as well. If we can catch a bird with a telephoto, I'll be very happy with our progress this episode. But no, there's nothing out there yet. So let's talk about the non-performing waterfall evaluation. So please, if you have any interest in these specific categories along the waterfall, um, drop a comment while we're going live here. Or if you're watching the video after we published it, leave a comment for a future episode in more detail. Now we have went through all of these different subsets of the non-performing waterfall evaluation in much detail in past episodes. Um, so if you're fully caught up, you may have already reviewed all of these with me in the past. Um, but I'd be happy to reiterate anything or ask specific questions that I can um, really hone in on something that maybe you're still unfamiliar with. But at the end of the day, we look for secured versus unsecured, and then we boil it down into lien position first or second, and then there's somewhat of a breakdown between how we analyze first liens versus second liens. I thought I saw a bird. Yep, there's another tip mouse out there. The tufted tip mouse. Um, so at the very end of the process, the biggest drivers of price here are for the first position lien, the value of the property, so what value band the property falls into, and also what the status of the unpaid taxes are. Those are the most important features when reviewing a first position lien. Whereas with reviewing a second position lien, the most important factors are the equity and the first lien status. Now, I am talking about non-performing loans here, so if it's a cash forming asset, one of the most important considerations is going to be the yield. And that's where we'll get into the market pricing. So uh, this has been updated for the fourth quarter, and I did have some re-performing loan sales this month that attributed to um, some changes in the pricing on this side. Um, and we do a lot of business on the non-performing side. So this is where I'm most familiar with the active market pricing. Uh, but at the end of the day, these numbers have not changed so much this year, as much as maybe you would expect with the ongoing pandemic and these <laughs> historically low interest rates, which are um, kind of two sides of the same coin here. We've got the pandemic affecting uh, the borrower's ability to repay, whereas we have the low interest rates affecting the property values, increasing the values and creating some pricing wars in um, really becoming a seller's market to get the best prices for well, at the same time as it's a seller's market, it's also a buyer's market because the interest rates are so low. Um, I think I mentioned this on a past episode. This is kind of an aside here, but I am working on a refinance of my property right now. And the 30-year fixed rate for an owner-occupied property is below 2.5%. I locked in the rate in December at 2.375%. If you are not contemplating a refinance and you own a home, definitely you'd be throwing money away if you have a rate more than about 3 4%. So definitely consider that and consider how that can support your borrowers as a note investor. Uh, it's really important to encourage borrowers to take advantage of these historically low interest rates, help them improve their credit so that they can afford a refinance, which will then pay you off in full as a note owner. So definitely some important considerations as the market changes here. Oh, there's that little friend again. Oh, we just missed him. If he's at the bottom of the feeder, we can get the telephoto shot. There he is. Oh, so close, so close. <laughs> okay, so um, another development that's been very pressing in the last couple weeks going into, um, well, pretty much the whole month, going into 2021 is 
enforceability of the CFPB and regulations and how as a note investor you can stay in line with these regulations. So there has been some updates this year, um, partly due to the new administration coming into power, being a little more focused on the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. And there's been actually before the election and after the election, there's been some developments here. So on the October uh, update, there was some changes with how collectors can communicate with borrowers. So just to give a quick recap of the October 2020 update, uh, collectors cannot call borrowers more than seven times per week. Borrowers must be allowed to opt out of electronic communication. It's got to be very easy for a borrower to click unsubscribe, essentially. And the FDCPA protections are now applied to the new communication technologies. So there is no... Um, difference between communicating via text or via phone or uh, well there are differences uh, but the protections to each of those lines of communication are consistent um, with regards to the borrower and that's what the CFPB is for it's for protecting borrowers so at the end of the day it's very very important to consider all of these regulations um, this most recent update in November was like a 500 page document that's really important to understand but I think more important than reading into every last well, that is important, but the most important, I believe, is your intentions as a debt buyer to support win-win resolutions for your borrowers. Because at the end of the day, this business exists because of the bank's failings to resolve non-performing loans. As, and as investors, we're able to fill in the gaps there and help borrowers in a more entrepreneurial way. So going into this business, going into every negotiation, every resolution with borrowers that you may have in your career as a note investor, you need to be considering the borrower and how you can resolve the loan in their best interest, as well as to make a profit as a note investor so that you can help more borrowers. But really think of that as your primary goal to help borrowers and these CFPB rulings kind of guide your, uh, your activity as a debt buyer. So the November 20, uh, and this just came out, but it's effective November 2021, and this is revisions to the Regulation F. So um, the highlights here, three highlights, are collectors required to provide detailed disclosures to begin communications. Your servicer should already be doing that, so um, it's not a big change, but it should be addressed here. And collectors are barred from attempting to collect statute of limitation debts. So the statute of limitations essentially defines when a loan collectability has expired, and it's different in every state. And actually that's part of the mastermind group. You can review the state-by-state -state statute of limitations considerations uh, for promissory notes. So a promissory note in some states expires five years after the maturity date. In other states, it, require, it expires after the last payment date or after the next due date. So there's different ways that statute of limitations is calculated, but and this is kind of a no brainer, but the CFPB finally is enforcing the fact that you cannot collect time barred debts, debts that have been expired due to the statute of limitations. So it's, I guess, important that they put it in there because some invest, uh, some debt buyers will pursue debts like this that are out of statute of limitations, uh, kind of banking on the borrower's ignorance. So this um, gives the investor, the debt buyer, a little bit more responsibility to not pursue debts that may be out of statute of limitations. Now you can pursue unsecured debt as a note investor. Uh, if you buy unsecured debt, it's a totally different collection process. You don't have secured collateral. It's more, more difficult to create a win-win resolution because you're not releasing a lien from the borrower's home, but you are re releasing a judgment to keep the borrower from having uh, that blight on their credit report, which can affect their ability to finance in the future. Um, but very important to understand that if the unsecured debt has also reached the statute of limitations, it is no longer collectible and it should not be pursued. And then finally, the borrowers must be provided a validation notice. Now, there are some requirements of this validation notice that your servicer should already be required and be um, fulfilling for you. But I'm going to zoom in here so you can see this a little bit better. Uh, debt collector, these are all the things that are required on that validation notice. Uh, debt collector communication disclosure, as we mentioned in the last slide, the debt collector's name and mailing address, the consumer's name and mailing address, the name and mailing address of the creditor with which the debt was owed on the itemization date, the account number or truncated account number, if any, associating the debt 
on the itemized date, the itemization date, the name of the creditor to which the debt is currently owed, the current amount of the debt, the amount of the debt on the itemization date, itemization related information, information about consumer protections, consumer response information, and consumer, uh, sorry, consumer dispute prompts. So what that essentially means is that as a, um, a collector sending out notices to your borrower, you need to be informing the borrower on how to request a QWR, a qualified written response, so that that borrower understands their right to request additional information of their lenders. So your servicer should already know this, and if you're with a licensed servicer, they should be fulfilling these requirements for you. Um, but as a note investor who outsources tasks like this to your servicer, you should understand so that you can protect yourself from the liability when interviewing servicers to work with or when auditing your servicer's communication with the borrower to make sure that everything's on the up and up. All right, so that is it for the CFPB review. This is going to be a theme going into 2021 because there are going to be some increased um, enforcement of these regulations in an industry consensus email that I sent out to some of my top buyers. Everybody is sort of on the same page that regulation is going to be the key word going into next year. And unfortunately, that does create um, some advantages for the lar larger note buyers, uh, which can consolidate the industry a little bit when there's smaller investors who maybe can't afford the licensing or can't afford in-house counsel, or there's things that sort of set them behind the larger scaled up players in the space who are able to fulfill all of these uh, not new requirements, some of them are new, but maybe more enforceable requirements of the CFPB going forward. So definitely consider this. There are links below in this video that have a whole bunch of content for you on the CFPB so that you can know exactly what to expect going into next year. All right, so let's get into today's feature, which are just kind of some, um, some slogans, some mantras that I have that I believe kind of encapsulates some of my business philosophies, especially related to the note business. So here's the four of them. Hurry up and wait, move in all directions, add value and do as you say. So these are all, um, and I didn't really set my slide up right, so we'll, we'll change it up like this. <laughs> these are all some, um, some useful idioms, I think that you can adopt as an entrepreneur, really in any business, but mostly related to notes in this presentation. So that first one, hurry up and wait, uh, this is actually very related to the note business. And what you're doing essentially setting the business in motion and then monitoring what happens next. So when you've set the business in motion, you're really um, kicking the ball out of your court as soon as it comes into it. So when you have multiple counterparties, uh, debt collectors and attorneys and realtors and servicers and other companies that are part of your team as a note investor, a lot of the time your job as the investor is just to make the decisions, set the ball in motion down these different paths um, and then sort of wait and see what happens next. So when you've got a pile up of emails in your inbox, you really want to consider those as each different opportunities to get the next step of the process going. So be, when you make these decisions, be confident with your decisions, make them quickly, but make sure that you are doing that so that you are able to continue the motion of each of these loan resolution processes. So when the ball is in your court, don't dawdle, kick it out, get it to the next counterparty to fulfill the next responsibility in the process. Things like the legal process take a lot of time and a lot of milestones along the way. So it is very easy to let one of those attorneys who are working on your behalf on an account kind of just sit on the sidelines waiting for a decision to be made. So you don't want that timing to affect your uh, process with regards to resolutions. Uh, another uh, point here is to follow a consistent timeline and refine that process. After you've had a, a time, sometimes 30 or 60 days, to pursue an amicable resolution with a borrower. So softer collection letters, you're not threatening foreclosure, you're really working with them and opening up those lines of communication to come to an agreeable resolution. You wanna make sure when that timeline has expired that you're moving on to the next step of the process. You want to limit the amount of variables that are out of your control so that you can really define what points of the process are giving you the most success as a note investor. So something that I like to do in this process is to tag all of your loans in the specific process that they're in and then 
assign somewhat of a probability to each of those steps of the way. So if you resolve a loan in the very beginning when they've sent the RESPA letter and the borrower has been introduced to the loan servicer and that borrower proactively reaches out and gets a deal done with your servicer without going to the demand letter or the escalated foreclosure process, you can look at your portfolio at a more holistic level to see how much percentage of the trade, how much percentage of your portfolio of assets is resolved very early in the process, how many it takes to go through the foreclosure, how many you know actually get to the sale date before they're resolved or the property is sold. So you can hone in on the specific asset classes that you're buying and what attributes, what areas of that process are uh, where those loans are actually getting resolved. So that's data mining. And if you collect all this data in the beginning, you can really optimize your acquisition process to be buying loans that best fit into your resolution process. So definitely follow a consistent timeline to eliminate the abundance of different variables uh, because there are so many variables already when buying mortgage notes that your collection process should be consistent and only refined after you've had some time to adjust to a specific consistent process for each asset. All right, so finally here, set de deadlines for your counterparties. This kind of has the same effect as the first one. Um, when the ball is in your court and perhaps you have a borrower uh, looking into their financials and getting back to you in a week, make sure you give them that one week deadline. If you're offering a discounted settlement opportunity for a borrower, make sure it has a deadline. There's no such thing as an indefinite settlement offer. There's time value of money and everything must be set with deadlines so that not only your borrowers, but your other counterparties understand your expectations and can live within that timeline to fit your model. So once you've set business in motion, you wanna monitor the situation. So monitoring in this case means auditing regularly, your taxes, your senior lien statuses, bankruptcy status, and even your occupancy status of your properties. So we've talked about many different ways to do all of this. For taxes, you can look at the specifically the county records for that property, and you can look at the tax collector's details. Most counties have an online portal where you can see the past due taxes on any property. Now that's a bonus because it also gives you the mailing address of the property owner. If that mailing address doesn't match the subject property, it is a non-owner occupied uh, asset at that point. So you can also be checking occupancy in the same place that you're checking your tax statuses. Senior lien status, you can collect based on a recent credit report. But if you have a historic credit report, you can use a automated phone system to get an update on that senior lien status uh, without ordering a new credit report. So that's another way you can check the audit of the senior lien status on a regular basis. And then finally, bankruptcy, you wanna use PACER, public access to court electronic records. You can do it manually by searching a social or a borrower's name in the bankruptcy court portal. Or if you've built somewhat of an API as we've done, uh, which maybe will one day be offered to the mastermind members, um, a bankruptcy monitoring tool is a great solution to check your whole portfolio to make sure that there aren't any proof of claims that need to be filed for uh, bankruptcies that have been recently filed. So definitely audit those attributes of the, your portfolio on a regular basis so that you're able to address any concerns. Now, something that's more important than all of that is to have your assignment of mortgage recorded. Because even if you're asleep at the wheel and you miss the fact that there's past due taxes or a pending bankruptcy, if you've recorded your assignment of mortgage, all of these different counterparties are required to notify you as the owner of that debt. So before any of this, when you buy an asset, record the assignment of mortgage or have the seller record the assignment of mortgage for you to make sure that you are on title. Everybody knows that you own that mortgage note. All right, let's also track and organize all your loan level data, correspondence and notices. This is what I mentioned with regards to data mining. You wanna have all of your data in place so that you're able to identify patterns and in the future be able to use artificial intelligence technology and other types of algorithms that are developed or you can develop with a team to further d dive into all of the data that you have in your portfolio. So definitely think in terms of future proofing. That's a big theme of this show to make sure your processes and procedures are tight, to make sure that you're documenting things and have solid systems in place. And one of those systems can really only be Actually, all of your systems can really only be effective if you're tracking all of that data. So make sure when you communicate with an attorney or a borrower or a servicer or any counterparty in this business 
that you track and organize at the loan level. So this is another thing that the mastermind group can help with because we use Podio, our CRM, to track all of the activity on an asset. And as a mastermind member, I can help you set up your Podio organization so that you're able to um, track all this correspondence directly on the loan level in a pretty consistent and very organized way using Podio. And then finally, follow up with your counterparties as necessary. So you set deadlines, but sometimes you don't have your counterparty achieve those deadlines and you do need to follow up, push things along and make sure that everybody is communicating and on the same page. Um, really that's in the best interest of everyone because if your team needs to file a foreclosure on an account, but you haven't reached out with that last olive branch, sure you're going to probably get that borrower they're going to be very interested in getting something worked out when they see a demand letter from an attorney but if you were able to do that amicably before you had to send the demand letter you'll save time and money on the legal which if you read your note documents the legal collection expenses are going to be owed by the borrower when you get to a foreclosure so to save everyone time and money make sure that you're reaching out to your borrowers to follow up on their deadlines so that you can resolve these loans in a more win-win resolution rather than going through the legal process which takes a lot more time and a lot more money all right so the next term here um, the next kind of phrase is move in all directions so this is um, an important way to approach note investing because there are so many different avenues that a loan can take to come to some positive resolution and by moving in all directions you open up the opportunity and you also limit the time it will take to pivot in one direction or the other if things don't work out so let's kind of drill into this unpack it uh, of course first the direction you want to primarily focus on is amicable resolutions and I mentioned this already as a note investor our goal is to resolve the debt with the borrower it's not to take borrowers homes it's not to extort them in some way because they have this secure debt hanging over their heads it's to come to amicable resolutions that help that borrower fit their financial situation so amicable resolutions are so important and you need to be proactive in seeking these win-win settlements modifications or liquidation of the property if that's what is in the borrower's best interest Another direction that you might want to move in is forced liquidation. So this is where you're foreclosing and having the property sold at a sheriff's sale, or maybe you need um, to go through a short sale process or some other alternative. So as the potential for these more positive traction is exhausted, you want to line up the legal process. Now, it's nice to have an attorney that offers somewhat of a um, a la carte type of uh, pricing option because in most cases a borrower will not let it go all the way to the foreclosure they'll want to resolve something prior to getting to that chair of sale date so you want to have your attorney ideally just charge you in that kind of piecemeal approach you could pay for the demand letter which may be a hundred hundred and fifty dollars maximum and have that demand letter sent and then see what happens next now, if the borrower is totally MIA and you do need to move through the foreclosure process, by having that attorney ready to go, you're going to eliminate some of the delay and the timing in getting to the next step. So you wanna line up the legal process, but if you can help it to avoid those expenses, move forward with the amicable res resolution at the same time, and definitely prioritize an amicable win-win resolution. So you really wanna allow the borrower an opportunity to settle throughout the collection process prior to the sale date. So um, now this does become a tricky calculation at some point because if you're a day away from the foreclosure sale and the borrower wants you know, another week or two weeks or a month to resolve something, that's probably gonna be a non-starter because you can't take the borrower at their word if they have ignored you all of that foreclosure process in the first place. But if you send the demand letter and you pull a title report and your attorney is moving forward with the next steps of the foreclosure, and the borrower reaches out and is apologetic, they wanna get it paid off and they offer you a settlement to close before the next milestone of the foreclosure process, definitely strongly consider that. The foreclosure is going to be so much more of a process, the timeline is very extensive, and it's very difficult for the borrower in that situation to go through a foreclosure. So whatever you can do to assist as an alternative foreclosure is very, very helpful. Now there are ways to do a liquidation that is not a forced liquidation. That's actually a sale of the property with the borrower's best intentions. So this could be, and depending on your goals or your cash requirements here, 
um, a sale of the actual mortgage note. So you could offer a non-performing loan to buyers to actually acquire the loan and do their own resolution. Maybe they're better suited for that specific geography or that specific situation, and they could collect that loan and create a win-win resolution better than you could as an investor. Um, you could also sell performing loans, performing assets for sale. If you start collecting payments on a loan, you could recapitalize in your portfolio by selling one of those uh, cash flowing assets. Um, and finally, seeking financing. So there's something called a collateral assignment, which is pretty rare and very difficult to negotiate with a bank, but it is possible because these are real assets to have a bank finance secured by a mortgage note. So they call it a collateral assignment, and essentially what it is is a second assignment of mortgage that the lender here, the bank, um, and it's not the lender, you as the note investor, but your bank financing, can record that assignment of mortgage in the event that you default on the loan secured by the loan. So it's a little difficult to, to understand because it's sort of like an inception of different loans. Um, but what this essentially does is allow you to recapitalize while still owning the asset. You're, sec you're securing new debt to these assets that you own um, with a collateral assignment as the security for your lender financing the deal. And what I was starting to get to here, and my slide doesn't really explain it very well, is the um, amicable liquidation events. So a short sale with the borrower or a deed in lieu of foreclosure. A short sale would be a, um, a sale of the property where a settlement, a discounted settlement is achieved on the loan, but it's done in an amicable way that still represents a profit for the investor and also helps the borrower sell without having a lingering deficiency balance against them. An unsecured deficiency balance is essentially the amount left over that they would still owe after selling the property. So in our short sales that we negotiate with our clients, we are waiving the right to pursue any deficiency judgment, any deficiency balance against the borrower. So that creates a win-win for a borrower. If they work with a realtor, get the property listed and sold, we're not gonna collect on the additional amount above the amount of the sale that they may still owe. Um, a, a deed in lieu of foreclosure, on the other hand, is actually having the borrower sign the deed over to the lender uh, in lieu of collecting the debt. So that's another option if the borrower no longer wants to live in the property and you're, you as an investor are capable of managing that specific property. So before we go to, back to the next slide, I just saw them fly away, we missed them. At least we saw a couple birds today. <laughs> All right, so next mantra here, the next idiom is to add value. You guys already know it. This is a really important part of my philosophy in business. Um, adding value is really uh, all we can do in marketing or in sales, in any area of business, adding value is what allows you to have repeat business and continuing to do well by others. Um, to have great relationships with your counterparties, you need to be providing more value than maybe what they're spending if they're paying you for consulting or if they're paying you for purchasing a mortgage note. The value that they're acquiring by exchanging their time or money should be more than the time or money that they're exchanging. So a couple points here to add value. First of all, first and foremost, win-win resolutions with borrowers. Of course, that's the theme in this business. We wanna help borrowers. And that adds a lot of value to a borrower who may be struggling to get a with their collection process with the previous lender, um, adding value through a win-win resolution is huge. Uh, we keep missing that bird. <laughs> so uh, forgiving arrears and late fees when appropriate is an, a great way to add value that's really no sweat for a note investor. You're buying loans at a discount already, and in exchange, uh, sort of a bargaining chip for the borrower's cooperation, you can forgive arrears and late fees in a lot of situations. So definitely consider this as an opportunity to create a win-win resolution, build a lot of good faith with your borrowers, and set in place, if it's a modification agreement, a long-term consistent payment plan of cash flow going forward because you're able to offer that forgiveness for the borrower. Now you can use it as a contingency, for example, if you do a trial modification plan where the borrower can uh, achieve the forgiveness of some of the principal or their arrears or late fees after making a certain amount of consistent payments, or you can structure it in a different way. At the end of the day though, because we buy loans at a discount in this space, there are many ways that you can create concessions for the borrower, build good faith, and a consistent performing loan in the future. 
So yeah, entertain discounted settlement offers. Um, a discounted settlement offer is essentially a payoff that's less than the unpaid principal balance owed. And these are really great capitalization events for the investor because of the time value of money. If you go through the entire foreclosure process to make 10 or even 20% more, sometimes a discounted settlement that really passes that discount along to the borrower early in the process is a higher internal rate of return. It's much less stress on you, much less stress on the borrower, and it settles the debt in a way that makes everyone happy uh, if it's done properly. Now, I do have a case study this week on a discounted settlement, so stay tuned for that, or if you're watching this video, you can skip ahead to it in the uh, chapter markers below in the scrubber. All right, so you also wanna have straightforward fixed rate modification agreements. Now, these are some ways you add value for the borrower, and by eliminating some of the confusion and uncertainty around legal contracts like a modification agreement, explaining it properly. Um, what I like to do is have all of these, these instructions basically copy and paste so that you're able to spell it out for borrowers in a way that makes sense and they can understand what their goal is. For example, if you're doing a interest only modification where the borrower is not paying down principal balance, you wanna to explain to them that the principal balance will remain the same throughout the terms of this modification agreement with the goal of you refinancing. There's no prepayment penalties, so we wanna help you refinance at these historically low interest rates. Sooner you can refinance, the better, because at this point you're only paying interest to keep the loan current. Um, with fixed rate modification agreements, are just think it's much simpler than an adjustable rate loan, and it really defines the terms in a way that the borrower can understand. After 120 payments, or maybe after 20 years, that loan will be paid down to zero, there's no balloon payment, and uh, especially when there are balloon payments, make sure to include an addendum in your modification agreement. Also, more things that are included in the mastermind group, you can review the modification agreements that we use and maybe adapt it to your own purposes so that you can be on the up and up with your borrowers, creating straightforward modification agreements. Here's another one, short sales, deed and lose, cash for keys options. I mentioned this on the last slide, but uh, these are some ways that you can help a borrower that no longer wants to reside in the property. You can help them sell the property and resolve it at a discount. You can deed the property back to the bank to get them out from under a debt that may be insurmountable to them or cash for keys. In some situations, you can actually offer money to the borrower to give you the deed in lieu. Um, it's pretty rare in most situations, but it is possible that the numbers work for both the investor and the borrower to offer cash for keys. Hey, here's a comment from Kevin. Love to see a video about financing collateral assignments. Um, unfortunately, I have not had success with using that collateral assignment financing option, uh, but we can certainly go into some more detail about the types of documents that would be used there and maybe even strategize on how to approach a bank with a deal like that. Um, the one approach that I took was for a portfolio of assets in Texas. I actually mentioned this to you on our call, Kevin. Um, and unfortunately, the bank just, it was... It was another language to them and they were not able to make that deal work. But with the right financing partner and potentially a higher interest rate, I think you could probably make that work with maybe a hard money lender or a more entrepreneurial financing company. It's definitely a good deal though for uh, an investor who understands the note business and has their documentation lined up. So as an investor seeking a, a collateral assignment financing deal, um, by having those documents all ready to go, um, you could make the process a lot easier for a bank to finance that. So we'll definitely talk about that in more detail. In fact, I hope you saw this, Kevin, but we, we're gonna do mastermind only, uh, mastermind members only Zoom calls once a month. Um, our first call will be next Wednesday and I'm gonna send an email about it as well. I think we're gonna do a 4 p.m. call, 4 p.m. Eastern time, and we can go into so much more detail on things like the collateral assignment. Uh, all right, so the other way you can add value in really any interactions in business is to reduce uncertainty. Uncertainty creates um, discounts, really. <laughs> By selling loans with all of the data researched and in place, you're reducing uncertainty and maximizing the value of the assets you may have for sale. By reducing uncertainty with your borrowers, you can have quicker decisions reached and you can definitely improve all of your relationships with counterparties by keeping things clear and without uncertainty. So for borrowers, investors, lenders, and other counterparties, reducing uncertainty is so important. Um, and here's another one, adopting a creative mindset. So uh, I, I'm not really referring to this as creative um, in terms of 
you know, art and, and producing things that are novel based on, you know, your own imagination. I'm really thinking of this in terms of productivity and adopting a creative creation mindset as opposed to a consumption mindset. Um, adding value is, can take so many different paths, but at the end of the day, it's about creating something and not consuming something. So as entrepreneurs, that's really our goal to add value through creation. So I think um, you could use this in terms of your own day-to-day -day activities. What areas of your life are you focused on creation? What areas of your life are you more focused on consumption? And try to balance that out because at the end of the day, if you are creating more than you're consuming, you're gonna have an easier time of it. At the end of the day, trying to consume more than you create is going to be a losing battle. And that's really what puts uh, a lot of Americans in a position where they're living paycheck to paycheck or trying to keep up with the Joneses. So I find it so much more fulfilling, so much more financially uh, advantageous to pursue creation uh, versus consumption. Uh, yeah, Kevin, you talked to a couple of banks and lenders down in Texas, report back. Uh, yeah, please do see if they have any interest at all. Um, it is still secured by real estate. It's just secured by real estate through the proxy of a mortgage note. Um, but with a company that knows how to manage mortgage notes, I think it's probably a safer investment for a bank. So let me know how the, that pitch goes for you. And if you're able to create some capital on um, note acquisitions down the line. Uh, one more point here on adopting a creative mindset. Uh, delay gratification. Do today what will yield benefits tomorrow. Um, that's a mantra that I wrote down uh, on a whiteboard when we lived in our old house. And I really believe that in a lot of ways, writing that down and, and internalizing that has allowed me to now live in a much better house. <laughs> and especially with the pandemic, getting out of the city of Philadelphia into the suburbs has been absolutely huge. So delay gratification when you can. That's another kind of cheat code to success. I think in any business, if you can pursue um, activities today that benefit you tomorrow and not selling out your future for you know, pleasure today, you're going to have a much easier time with it, be much more satisfied and set your life up in a way that gets progressively better every single day. So definitely focus on that, um, creating, not consuming. Okay, we got one more little mantra, a little idiom here, and that is do as you say. So. This is so important, but so you know, obvious. Reputation is everything. And if you do as you say you're going to do, you'll have much more opportunities to work with other people in the future, creating value, and also creating really great life for yourself. So make sure that if you are making offers on mortgage notes that you follow it up and you make sure you communicate with your sellers so you're not on some blacklist because you didn't, you submitted an LOI and then you flaked out. You really want to make sure you do as you say in any business, in any relationship really, it will really make uh, things work out much better for you. So definitely consider that in this business. All right, that's it for these uh, four little mantras, four little uh, points of, I think, assistance for any business. And we'll jump right into the hardware and software we use to run this business. So. You know this slide, you love this slide, I love this slide at least. <laughs> this is all of the different tools that we use in this business and I don't think I've left anything out here. Um, we've really put together all of these tools. I just totally skipped over it. Let me, let me jump back here, <laughs> if, if it even works. Okay, here we go, ready? Yes, the hardware and the software. So if you've got a smartphone, you might not even need a computer in this space. I've been using the Podio app on my phone lately and I'll get a call while I'm doing yard work and put it on speaker. They'll be hearing the birds chirping in the background, <laughs> but open up my Podio app and I can actually start logging information right on my phone while I'm communicating with a counterparty on a specific asset. So Podio is so huge and I might even cross out the fact that you need a PC. You can do a lot with a smartphone. Although Excel, you really can't get around it using a computer to run your models and um, operating in Excel or Google Sheets, so much easier on a PC. But in any case, you can do a lot. Once you have things set up in a way that is automated as, as much as possible, you can do so much with just your phone and leave your computer at home sometimes. So uh, Citrix Podio workflow automation is Globaflow. That's how we connect Podio to all these other services. Um, in the beginning, you wanna do a lot of these things manually. It's important to build a relationship with the vendor. For example, data tree is how we, uh, where's my mouse? Uh, oh wait, you're not even seeing the mouse. 
okay, whatever, can't point. But <laughs> Data Tree is um, a really great tool to manually review assets, to review property records, to see the lot lines, to see who owns the property. I use Data Tree often to see who owns the subsequent adjacent properties. For example, if you've got a vacant lot and you wanna see if the local owners in that neighborhood maybe wanna acquire the adjacent lot to them, you can use Data Tree to see a map of all of the owners in that area. It's a super useful tool that basically gives you a better window into public records. Um, CoreLogic is a way to uh, basically do the same thing as Data Tree, but on a mass scale. We've reviewed CoreLogic Credco in previous episodes. Um, I think trying to spin this in a little bit of a different way for benefit to those of you who've seen all the past episodes. And I think going into this space, the most important services you need to start are a database of some kind. So I like to use Podio and it's free for a couple users to begin with without the automation options or using Excel or Google Sheets to manage your data. And then you need a research tool as well. So I would say Data Tree is a super useful tool in the beginning, although you can review public records at the county level, just logging into um, a website of a county recorder. So you don't always need Data Tree, but I think a Data Tree account and a good database to track your data is a really great place to start. Now you will be leveraging some things that your seller has if you do not have access to TransUnion, for example, for credit reports. But if your seller has the documentation provided to um, start your due diligence, you maybe can get away with not having access to credit reports in the beginning of your career as a note investor. Now, Pro Title USA is uh, where we order title reports for the most part, and um, you can do that without setting up an account. So Pro Title is used kind of on a um, a la carte one-off level when you need a title report. You reach out to Alex Goldovsky over there, or just go to their website and you can uh, submit a title order there. Um, but Data Tree, since you do need a subscription, it's a little bit different. A lot of these tools, though, uh, Pacer, for example, the subscription process is, is very simple. That's where you're going to review bankruptcy data. Um, right signature, although you need a subscription and it's a useful tool, I would say it's not required in the beginning of the process because um, you can do a lot of signature type of stuff manually, but it is useful. Uh, so much here to talk about. Zapier, for example, I know Kevin uh, knows how to use Zapier as well, but you can create really easy automations for yourself that can, like I said, benefit you in every tomorrow going forward. Something you do to set up today can make your life better uh, for all of your tomorrows. So we'll review this slide again and again, but in more detail with these different web services going forward. Please leave a comment if you have some specific question about these services or how to get things set up. Also, the Mastermind Group is a very useful place to learn more about Podio and the various ways that we can connect Podio to some different services. All right, so quick commercial here on how to get ready for 2021. I'm gonna go like this. So uh, 2021, we'll have some more assets available in the spring. And the way that you sign up for that is to go to fixnotes.com slash buy. You click this little button for sign NDA for access. You complete the form that pops up. You'll be emailed the non-disclosure agreement along with your login credentials. Um, once you click that first email there for the non-disclosure agreement, It'll send you an update that the non-disclosure agreement's been executed and that your membership level in fixnotes.com uh, has changed from uh, the course access to course plus inventory access. Once you have inventory access, you can click on that buy notes page once again, and you'll see you are course plus inventory access. And then the buy notes page has been updated with confidential information. So it's very important to go through this non-disclosure agreement process because borrower information in order to review mortgage notes is very much personally identifiable and confidential. So in order to properly analyze a loan, you need access to that personal information and you need to disclaim that through the non-disclosure agreement that you will protect that confidential borrower information. So yeah, pretty easy. You'll see all the assets for sale. Uh, we are sold out for the end of 2020, but going into 21, we will have some more assets available, maybe in the middle of first quarter. All right, let's get into the case studies here. And like I said, I have a case study this week on a discounted settlement. This is a discounted payoff on a non-performing second mortgage secured by single family residential property. Paid off the loan for 12,750 bucks. And let's jump into it. So the fair market value of this home was 225 
$150. The senior lien was approximately $220,000, which doesn't leave that much equity. There's $5,105 of equity covering the junior position lien of $25,454. So it's interesting to see a loan like this because where it does have equity above the first lien, so the second lien investor has partial equity here. From the borrower's perspective, it is underwater. It's higher than 100% CLTV, the combined loan to value which means that the borrower is in somewhat of a tough spot because both of their loans combined are worth more, they owe more than the value of the entire property. So let's go through the questions. What happened? Where are you now? What do you wanna do? Those are the first things you wanna know from a borrower so that you can craft a resolution that fits their needs. So this property was a rental, um, but it's no longer fully occupied. And obviously that has resulted in a reduction of income. Um, it may be COVID related, uh, I think though this situation was pre-COVID as far as the um, inhabitability of one of the units because we found out that the property was in pretty rough shape. Good news though, it was a duplex. So there was two units, one of them was rented, uh, but the other was not. They needed a roof and siding, some interior updates, and we did confirm the borrower's um, summary of the property through Google Street View. And make sure when you're looking at Google Street View, you look in the lower right hand corner and you make sure that the Street View image is recent because sometimes you'll see a Google Street View from five, 10 years ago. The property might look like it's in good shape, but it may be not today. So if you look at the date in the corner of Street View, you can see how recent the image from the Google car was. So the borrower was about, uh, had about 10,000 available for a payoff if the investment committee would accept a discount on this loan. So right off the bat, that was definitely a consideration here. We were underwater already, or he was underwater and we were partial equity, not a pretty good, uh, not a very good situation for the lender either. Uh, but so 10,000 sounded pretty good on this and we started to negotiate. So although the senior was unknown in acquisition, another data point we achieved early on in the process is to confirm that the senior was current with a current senior lien statement from the borrower. So that's how we really discovered that it was partial equity. When this loan was purchased, it was purchased as an unknown senior lien where you can get much better discounts because of uncertainty. When you have uncertainty in these situations, the pricing is significantly reduced. And in this case, that's how we got a better deal on this loan. So we ended up negotiating on this file to get a $12,750 discounted uh, payoff to close by the month end. So a little more than the borrower's you know, initial offer and it made sense and they were able to make it work. And at the end of the day, it worked for everybody. So let's look at the metrics here. This loan was purchased for 3,200 bucks. So 12.5% of the unpaid principal balance was a really solid deal on this when we discovered that the senior was current. It was a very good deal at, in the beginning um, because it was purchased as part of a package. So we did get a better pricing because it was purchased as part of a portfolio. Uh, but it was a better deal because the senior was unknown and that uncertainty was in place in the beginning. So after three months and $425 of expenses, and that does include the due diligence process, onboarding the loan with our servicer and some minimal collections, uh, we were able to get a payoff here of $12,750. And that was such a quick payoff, three months, that your internal rate of return here is going to be huge. So we'll look at the internal rate of return in just a minute. Uh, a couple takeaways though. Um, right off the bat, like I said, the senior unknown high CLTV second lien offered strong discount discounts for the non-performing loan purchase. Now I say high CLTV, but in the beginning, before you know the senior status, you don't know exactly what that combined loan to value is. What we do in these situations when we've got a unknown senior lien and it's not reporting to the credit report, is to look at the origination amount of the first position loan. So by taking the origination amount, say this $220,000 loan originated for $250,000 maybe five years ago, you can plug in that $250,000 as a conservative approach to how much the senior is owed. Now, it's not totally accurate because the senior could actually have a payoff balance that's more than the origination amount if the borrower has been in default, but it gives us a data point to calculate equity where else otherwise we wouldn't be able to because of the unknown senior lien. So that's what resulted in that 12.5% acquisition price and uh, would, which was absolutely blown out of the water once we knew the senior was current. Now we could have sold this loan. 
Um, but, and actually, I'm skipping ahead here. <laughs> One more. Receive senior lien detail from the borrower statement. So actually, I didn't skip ahead because I said that. <laughs> Since the credit was not reporting, we got the senior lien statement from the borrower, which told us the status and the balance of the loan. Now, the discounted settlement amount in this case was higher than the non-performing loan sale value. So I've stressed this many times this episode already, but a borrower resolution is the best all around win-win. If you sell the loan, you're passing the buck and you're also increasing the cost basis for the next buyer so that they need a little bit more from the borrower to make the numbers work. So when you're looking at a deal like this, settling the loan for 50% of the unpaid principal balance, oops, wrong keyboard. Settling for 50% of the unpaid principal balance with the borrower releases the lien, settles the deal, it helps everybody out, and we would have gotten less than that if we were to have sold this loan. So on one hand, we reduced some of the uncertainty by getting that senior lien statement. Uh, it still showed us that the, the deal was partial equity, so it wouldn't be worth as much as a premium senior current with equity loan, but it would not be worth more than 50% of the unpaid principal balance. So really important when you have this opportunity to sell a loan or, and even if the numbers were a parity to each other, selling a loan versus resolving a loan, you always want to approach the loan to resolve it with the borrower. And that's going to be your best bet to settle the debt and not pass the buck. So an important consideration when resolving discounted settlements is to consider how much the loan would be worth, but to put a little bit more weight into resolving with the borrower because that's how you create a terminal value of the loan. It doesn't continue to extend the situation. So like I said, the IRR on this one was massive, over 1000% internal rate of return for this non-performing loan resolution because it happened in only three months. So if we were to take a year to settle this debt, it would have been over 100%, which is great, but because we were able to do it in just three months, the internal rate of return is absolutely massive and could then be turned around to more asset acquisition opportunities within the same year. So if you turn over a couple deals like this per year, your internal rate of return is going to be astronomical, more than a thousand percent if you're able to turn them around quickly. Uh, but this is a cherry picked case study, so your mileage may vary, of course, um, but by diversifying, by buying loans like this that looked unknown in the beginning, you're able to achieve a little bit more upside than if you're just buying the highest tier loans, senior current equity second liens, for example. Uh, so it's important to diversify, to give yourself the opportunity to have some upside and not just be buying the premium 50% of unpaid principal balance loans where they work out and you can great, achieve a great return there, but you don't have much room for error if something maybe was incorrect or the senior lien maybe wasn't as high of a balance or sorry, the equity wasn't as high as you'd expected. All right, so that was our 53rd case study of the year. And here is number 54, a non-performing second lien secured by single family residential property that was sold. So this was an investor loan sale, kind of the flip side of the coin here. On one hand, we resolved with the borrower. On this loan, we sold it to a local investor who is better suited to achieve a resolution on this deal. Sold for 37,000 um, and I messed up my animation there, it disappeared, but it'll come back. So the fair market value on this loan was 378,437 minus a senior lien balance of $278,044, offers $100,393 of equity, securing our $93,146 uh, 93, unpaid principal balance. So there's equity here. There's more than enough equity. The combined loan to value is less than 100%. So this is a pretty solid deal for an investor to purchase. So we're gonna talk about three points. Is it a bulk or a retail sale? Uh, what were the due diligence findings? And what was the final purchase decision? So this was another bulk sale. Uh, it's kind of the theme for the end of the year here. Part of a year end closeout of some legacy inventory. The due diligence findings, the senior was current. Uh, the property value is higher than expected, uh, higher than it was when we purchased the loan. There's full equity coverage, as you can see on the left side, and the property is in a non-judicial, relatively fast foreclosure state in a metropolitan area. This was actually Las Vegas, Nevada. So it's a pretty attractive place for note investors to acquire loans. Um, it did appear to be an owner-occupied property, and the Chapter 13 bankruptcy that was on the record had been dismissed. So it 
we didn't dig into the bankruptcy record, but when you see a dismissed bankruptcy, um, it doesn't have any play anymore on the collectability of the loan since it was dismissed, not discharged. However, it's very useful if you pull up PACER and look at that borrower's voluntary petition. Even if it was a dismissed bankruptcy, you can still get some detail on the borrower's financial situation by looking at that bankruptcy filing. Um, so another kind of layer to due diligence that could have been possible on this loan. Final purchase decision, buy the loan for $37,258 as part of a package of non-performing loans. So let's look at some other considerations here. It was a fire sale to recapitalize on year-end opportunities. Um, so these non-performing loans were sold, they were purchased as part of a diversified package deal. So the pricing was maybe a little bit better than a one-off. Um, stronger buyer discount, like I said, was achieved due to the bulk acquisition. And this was a non-performing loan sale with no borrower contact. So there was some potential here for some low hanging fruit. We did not pursue a foreclosure. We did not even send a demand letter on this loan. So uh, while we could have pursued it as a collection, you know, actually get a resolution completed with the, this borrower, it made more sense to sell it to an investor who's able to manage a portfolio of loans on the West Coast that has a little bit more um, of a process set up for this type of deal. Whereas we can then, uh, my client in this case who sold the loan can then focus on the loans on our side of the country and get some more deals done with more borrower attention given. So in this case though, it was sold, like I said, for $37,258, which is 40% of the unpaid principal balance. That's a very solid deal for this investor. Um, I, I think this loan as a one-off would have been worth more than 50%. But because it was sold as a package, because of the year-end uh, opportunity here, they got a deal to then pass that discount, hopefully along to the borrower to get a resolution completed. So that's it for case studies here. Uh, we did number 54 for the year. Uh, we started in April, I think was our first show. We've done two case studies every week. We did repeat two when the audio got screwed up on like episode six. Um, but in any case, we've done a new case study, two new case studies every single week since. All right, so 15 minute consultations. This is our giveaway. I'd really appreciate a subscription to this, at least consider it subscribing to the Fixed Notes channel. Uh, like this video, it helps out hugely for the YouTube algorithm. And then leave a comment. That also is very, very helpful. And also probably the best way to get a hold of me. I'm very focused on getting all of my YouTube comments answered. So if you have any specific questions after this video is live, drop them on the chat below. So the 15 minute consultation, however, you can book me, robbymax.youcanbook.me uh, for a 15 minute free consultation if it's our first time meeting each other. Um, and then from there, we can set up consulting calls going forward. And if you're a mastermind member, you get 50% off my consulting rate. So definitely consider that. The 2021 schedule. All right, another new thing for this week. Um, so let me do it this way. Uh, so we, we're going to start a mastermind call. Once a month, we're gonna have a call the first Wednesday of every month. Um, and that is uh, going to be facilitated by Zoom. So we'll have all of the other mastermind members available to ask questions and actually discuss specifics on your assets or your portfolio or the most recent activities in your business. And the fixednotes.com slash MNM page is where you sign up for the mastermind. It's $30 per month. You'll be grandfathered in at that rate, but it is going up to $40 per month in 2021, uh, January 1st. And that gives you access to podio.com slash fixnotes slash mastermind. So if you're already a mastermind member, I wanted to put this out there so that you know how to get to the podio page if you ever lose the link. Uh, podio.com slash fixnotes.mastermind is our private podio workspace with all of that additional content. And then the new schedule for Be The Bank, uh, final Wednesday of the month, we're gonna put on the Be The Bank YouTube show, which we're here with. We've already put out this year over 24 hours of content. So in order to let some of our new viewers catch up and to spend a little bit more time on a monthly basis putting together this show, we're going to change from weekly to monthly. First Wednesdays is the private mastermind call. Final Wednesday of the month is the Be The Bank show. Next show coming out on the 27th of J January, next month. So definitely stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, since we've got way more time to prepare each show, which I guess is a little bit more pressure for me, <laughs> definitely leave some comments with uh, things you want me to dive a little bit deeper into to most benefit you and your business. 
All right, thank you so much for watching, everyone. This has been awesome. Uh, as always, I enjoy presenting the show. It took a week off, which was a little bit sad, so I'm really happy to be back with some more Mortgage Note content that hopefully is getting you to the next level. It'll be the Bank Show every single last Wednesday of the month. And that's it, that's it for the show. All right, I'm gonna throw up the bird feeder in case we've got some more of those little friends hanging out with us, and uh, we'll just hang out lower our blood pressure by watching the birds for a minute and then um, call it a day. So let me do that. Oh, look at the battery. We're almost dead. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll see you next week. Please consider joining the mastermind. And I would love to see you back in Podio and then on our Zoom call next Wednesday. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great day.